From New York City for our viewers worldwide, I'm Manish Cranny in for Jonathan Farrow. The stock market simply does not take the bait from the lower PPI. We're caught somewhere in the vortex between bid up by Jamie Dimon and offered by Jane Fraser. The countdown to the open, it starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Coming up this Friday, wrapping up a volatile week with more inflation data. Earnings take center stage. The bank results, they begin to roll in. And oil tops 80 bucks a barrel after air strikes against Houthi rebels in Yemen. We begin with the big issue. Guess what? Earnings season. We have big bank earnings, those banks' earnings. There's a fairly high bar. The banking industry in the United States is uh, doing extre extremely well. The banks have had a very big move, 30% plus in the last six weeks. And we're talking about 85% of financials are in an uptrend. Are those sort of strong numbers that we've seen in terms of performance going to hold up? The fourth quarter earnings are not really going to be as much in focus as what people say and what companies say on those fourth quarter earnings about 2024. The key theme of earnings for 2024 at large is do they broaden out? We've got some pretty juicy ex Built in. We're in a position where earnings are recovering more broadly this year. Right. We really go in and look at the financials for clues on the plumbing of the economy, on the health of the consumer. It's going to be a really messy quarter. Loan growth continues to be pretty soft. The banks are striving for positive operating leverage. It's really a function of revenue growth from here uh, is, I think, what, uh, what we're certainly going to be focused on. Join me now to break down the earnings and the sentiment, JP Morgan's Priya Misra and Jay Palowski at TPW Advisory. If I look at what Jamie Dimon has told us, the U.S. consumer remains strong. They are spending. They continue to be resilient. So I'm bid up on Jamie Dimon, and yet we have the PPI numbers coming down. This equity market doesn't believe the disinflation narrative. Let's start the conversation with the sentiment from the bank CEOs, Jay Palowski. Jamie Dimon, I believe him every time. The U.S. economy continues to be strong. Consumers are still spending, and the markets expect a soft landing. What does that do for you? Good morning. Uh, yes, good morning, and uh, happy Friday. Um, you know, Jamie Dimon has said many things over the years, uh, and sometimes he's right, sometimes he's wrong. <laughs> Guess what? It's the markets. Um, you know, we're, we're constructive uh, on things. We think uh, the market is strong. Uh, a number of sectors are breaking out uh, to all-time highs. Uh, the thing that really struck me after being on vacation the last couple of weeks and coming back this week is uh, NVIDIA. And I know this is not a bank, but just bear with me real quick. So NVIDIA is the poster child for the AI innovation age. And yet it is trading at the cheapest multiple it's traded at in the last five years, even after the run it's had because earnings have exploded so much. And so, you know, financials, we like financials, mostly in Europe, also somewhat in the U.S. Uh, we like the leadership sectors, which are cyclicals, semis, industrials, things of this nature. We're constructive on risk assets into 2024. OK, I, and certainly if yields continue to drop as they are at the moment, then that will support that. Priya, good morning to you. What's, wh what's the spoiler alert here? Because you ultimately see a hard landing and that's not what I'm seeing in the commentary that's coming through. Citigroup have got their own domestic issues to play with. Wells Fargo needs to cut costs. But when it comes to the U.S. economy, uh, you know, you, you're still seeing a, a strength there in the consumer. Delinquencies are rising. So you go for a hard landing. Why? Sure. So I would say, you know, right now we're oh, we're very much in a soft landing. Uh, the consumer is resilient. And I think the Fed is trying very hard to keep that soft landing continue. So all this talk around perhaps the end or, or slowing of QT for the Fed to start to cut rates, they're trying very hard to get that soft landing. And the only way we get a soft landing is if the Fed was to start to cut rates, start to normalize policy across QT as well as rate cuts. Now, I think March is a little too too soon, and I think the reason why the market's a little wobbly is, number one, we had a really strong fourth quarter, right? We had, uh, you know, significant outperformance across asset classes. Some of this is we need more data. Some of it is nervousness around how quickly will the Fed start to cut. I think the market might be a little too optimistic in terms of looking for the first rate cut in March. 
Um, and if the Fed is not that aggressive or they start slow and they cut 25 basis points, you know, those lags work both ways. So we, we think policy is restrictive. The reason I'm in the hard landing camp is I think policy is restrictive. Real rates well north of 10-year real rates are, mm -hmm. are north of 1 percent, you know, closer to 2 percent. That's putting uh, an, an impact on the consumer, on the corporate sector as this lock-in, the low rate lock-in effect starts to, you know, fade and people start to refinance their debt, they, the, those interest rates start to hurt. If the Fed doesn't cut rates quickly enough, I think that's what's going to slow things down. And I think that will force them to have to ultimately cut a lot more than what is priced in. But right now we're in this, you know, tricky time period because the economy is resilient. We're seeing inflation continue to come down. And I think the way we can maintain that soft landing is if this immaculate disinflation continues. But I'm just a little nervous that the Fed might want to look for a little bit more proof or start cutting rates a bit low. And that's what's going to slow things down. And then I think we're going to see a lot more dispersion within the risk asset spectrum. OK, well, that's going to be a debate as to whether they're late to the party in the size and the scale uh, in terms of the cuts. Let's go under the hood. We've had another inflation report for the United States. Surprisingly low print on core producer prices. Mike McKee is with me. Mike, the, the short end of the curve loves this. Take me through the details. <laughs> yeah, well, it is a little complicated in that we saw some revisions to the prior month, November, that uh, pushed PPI even lower for that month. Now, we even though we get a, a negative print for the headline number on a month-over-month -month basis, we go up on a year-over-year -year basis. But overall, it is pretty good news. As you can see here, uh, now, let's go under the hood, as you said, uh, on the PPI trade issue. Uh, trade services in the U.S. is basically what the uh, BLS looks at. Uh, they look at uh, margins at retailers and wholesalers to come up with this number. Look at that. Uh, the margins have fallen tremendously over the last month because I guess prices uh, have been going down and you're not being able to pad your margins with the higher prices. So that tells you something maybe about what we might see from retailers during the earnings season. Now, uh, if you're looking at what's happening with the banks, as we are today, we could call this the PPI for the banks. The reaction to all of this is that now we have about an 80 percent chance of a Fed rate cut in March despite what Loretta Mester and others are saying. So the cost of money is going to go down. The question is, are you going to see it in uh, what the banks are charging you? Uh, PPI and CPI, the ongoing question is, does PPI lead CPI? Uh, not usually, but right now it's been falling faster than CPI. So that does increase the optimism about it. And the interesting thing is a number of components of PPI go into the PCE, which is, of course, the Fed's target. And according to analysts so far this morning who have taken apart this PPI, it means we're likely to get a sub 3% PCE when we get to the end of the month. And that will be uh, the first time since, we, uh, since the uh, pandemic. And that'll get people's attention. That certainly will. Interesting on those margins. Let's take that straight to Jay. Jay, I, I, I wrap up the consumer. Jamie Dimon tells me they are strong and they're spending, but they're spending on credit cards and those delinquencies are rising to the highest level in a decade. Margins are dropping. Delinquencies are rising. Um, how hedonistic can the U.S. consumer continue to be Jay. Yeah, we're constructive on the consumer. Household net, household net worth is at an all-time high. Uh, you know, in, uh, uh, payments for interest and credit cards and things of that nature, as you notice, quite low uh, on a personal income basis. And so we think the, the consumer is fine. We have record low unemployment, and um, that's not really uh, a, a concern for us. So um, when we look at things, we're really focused on not when the Fed will cut but why it will cut. History shows very clearly. If the Fed is cutting because real rates are high mm -hmm. and there's room to cut, and that's where we are today, uh, that is bullish for stocks. If the Fed is cutting because recession is imminent, that's bearish for stocks. Fourth quarter GDP, according to the latest Atlanta Nowcast, suggests growth of about 2.5%. Consensus for GDP for this coming year, for, for 2024 in the U.S., is about 1%. The bar is quite low. And the real important data point for us is that earnings expectations are double digit, not only for 2024, but for 2025. And so when we think about the markets, we're looking at a market, equities, U.S. equities that are breaking out to new all-time highs, double digit growth for the next two years. 
That's pretty constructive. And there's the rest of the world, by the way, which is also doing well, and segments of that are also breaking out, particularly Latin America and Japan. So we see a lot of market strength. Okay, I, I'm going to come back to Japan in a moment. I'm a bit fascinated by, by the Japan trade, uh, which can have an impact on American treasuries as well. Uh, Priya, uh, the, 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 the type and quality and timing of rate cuts is going to matter. It's either disinflationary narrative that continues, and that gives me constructive, mellifluous rate cuts, or it's a recession and a hard landing on the way, as you suggest, which might mean chunkier back-ended rate cuts. Is that the camp you're in, which is chunkier back-ended rate cuts and ultimately taking bonds uh, to around 3%? you say? We are, yes. I think in a hard landing, the Fed's cutting rates to 2%, perhaps even lower. So that can take that 10-year Treasury, you know, uh, closer to 3%. But I would say even in a soft landing, the Fed is likely to cut rates to 3%. You know, we can debate whether they start in March, do they start with 25 or 50, or, or do they sort of start later this year. But let's look at the total amount of cuts that's priced in. The market's pricing in the end point after all the rate cuts at three and a quarter. I would argue that's high even in a soft landing scenario. In a soft landing scenario, the Fed thinks neutral rate is closer to two and a half. I think the Fed could cut even in a soft landing close to two and a half or three percent, that's actually lower than what's priced in. So I would argue that the 10-year is likely to decline, even in a soft landing, less in a soft landing. I think we end up in a three and a half percent range in soft landing. In a hard landing, we're going, you know, two, three percent or lower. So I think to the extent that the Fed has opened the door, I know they're telling us not so fast, they've opened the door to normalization in, in terms of uh, at least rate cuts here, resulting in some start of easing. That's bullish for bonds. And I think this correlation, we've all struggled with it for the last two years, correlation between equities and bonds, they come back. If the Fed's starting to respond, whether they're normalizing or they're actually cutting rates to easing territory, I think owning some duration here against risk assets makes a lot of sense. In that narrative, very briefly, because I do want to square off on Japan with, with Jay, um, does that make you incrementally bullish on credit, Priya? It does. I mean, I think credit spreads have tightened a lot. Mm. But from a carry standpoint, if you do your credit work and you're picking these high quality companies that still have decent margins, still have decent earnings, I think it does make sense. High quality investment grade credit, I, I, you know, I, okay. uh, I think does make sense. I, I got to throw it to you, Jay. You're the only one that's come on the show that, that, that goes beyond borders. I've been banging on about Japan all week, 34 year high, biggest rally in two years. How long of Japan do you want to be briefly? Yeah, no, we're double weight uh, versus our benchmark, and we just extended that uh, positioning into the Japanese small caps where there's uh, tremendous value. Japan's got a lot going for it, okay. but what really excites us is that um, there's going to be a domestic reallocation away from bonds, which is what uh, the retail investor in Japan has been doing for decades, to stocks. And we think there's significant upside, very cheap market, exposed to global growth. Uh, exposed to AI and to EVs, lot to like in Japan. Jay, thank you very much. Squaring it away there, Priya Misra stays with me uh, to go through more in these markets. Let's go under the hood. The opening bell is just uh, 18 minutes away. Abigail Doolittle is side by side with me. What have we got, Abby? Well, beneath that relatively flat surface for U.S. futures, we do have some movement, starting off with the shares of Tesla. They are down, down right now by about 2.9%, uh, almost 3% on the news that they've reduced the price in the Model 3 in China by almost 6%, the Model Y SUV by about 3%. They also yesterday announced that they're shutting down their Berlin plant temporarily on the Red Sea conflict. Investors not liking it. United Health down 3.4%, although it is off the lows. Now, they beat on the surface, but a gauge of medical expenses beneath the surface was higher than expected, and it's throwing the whole uh, insurance, health insurance group off lower. J.P. Morgan up 2.2%, the best in breed bank. Well, they beat adjusted earnings. FIC, uh, that fixed income, commodities, currency trading up 8%. Equities down 8% into today, up 22%. It seems as though that uh, rally will continue, Manus. Abby, thank you very much. Coming up on the show, the U.S. launching airstrikes in Yemen. The attack was a strike on Houthi rebels. It is a con attack consistent with the administration's uh, plan to have a gradual escalatory approach to the region. Escalating geopolitical tensions fuel the leg higher in oil prices. That conversation next on Bloomberg.
attack was a strike on Houthi rebels. It is a con attack consistent with the administration's uh, plan to have a gradual escalatory approach to the region. Houthi rhetoric and Iranian rhetoric will remain defiant and strong, but again, we're likely to see Houthi attacks against shipping in the in their neighborhood. Their reach uh, is really not far beyond that. This response was tactical in deterring and degrading activity. It was not strategic. It was not aimed at leadership or destroying all Houthi military assets. The U.S. and the U.K. retaliating against the Houthi attacks, launching about 70 airstrikes on rebel targets in Yemen. President Biden says this. The United States will not allow hostile actors to imperil the freedom of navigation in one of the world's most critically commercial routes. A senior Houthi leader is saying that the response to the strikes is, quote, imminent. The latest developments boosting oil prices. Brent topping 80 bucks for the first time in 2024. Team coverage assembles. Katie Lines in D.C., Will Kennedy in London. Katie, it's interesting there to hear that take, which is this was a tactical strike, not a strategic escalation. But Biden makes it clear he's ready to do more. Well, the U.S. and its allies for weeks, Manus, have been warning of consequences if the Houthis were to continue their attacks on shipping in the Red Sea, which they have. So now we have gotten a taste of what those consequences actually look like. As you say, 70 airstrikes conducted by the U.S. and U.K. on really infrastructure targets within Yemen, trying to impair the Houthis' ability to continue to conduct these attacks. The U.S. military says it was 16 sites in total that were hit, including airports, radar installations, and storage and launch facilities for drones and missiles. So again, go going after the infrastructure here, and according to the Houthis, killing five fighters in the process. It really, though, is going to become a question of what happens next. We already have heard from the Houthis, as you mentioned. They have said a response is eminent after the leader of the Houthis just yesterday warned of a big response if the U.S. were to hit it mil militarily, it proceed with military action. It said it will confront the American aggression and any American attack won't go unpunished. They are uh, unpunished. They are also vowing to continue the attacks on commercial vessels and saying that the U.S. and U.K. interests are now legitimate targets. There's also other considerations here. Of course, the Houthis are backed by Iran. Could this draw Iran more directly into conflict with the U.S.? is a question this morning as Iran has condemned these airstrikes. Russia has as well. And Turkey's President Recep Tayyip Erdogan says that the U.S. and U.K. acted disproportionately here and could turn the Red Sea into a sea of blood. That has always been the concern, man, is that actual offensive action could escalate this conflict in the Middle East. And I guess we may be about to find out the extent to which that is true. Yeah, it, it certainly is. And it's reflected in oil prices to a degree this morning. Kelly, thank you very much. Will Kennedy, let me bring it to you. I mean, for the first time in a while, we've seen a, a bid return to the oil market. It's a debate as to what level of war premium is. Standard Chartered says it's $10. Rapid and says it's $12 from when I spoke to, to Bob last week. What would you say to the price action this morning? The Saudis are uncomfortable with this level uh, of escalation as well. Yep, um, I think you've seen probably the, the biggest reaction to events in the Middle East that we've seen this year and obviously making high for the years earlier this morning. And I think that reflects the real risk of escalation from here, uh, as Kylie uh, alluded to. I think there are two risks. Firstly, it is Houthi retaliation and them attacking a much broader range of shipping so far. The action has been against mostly container shipping, and we've seen that uh, have an impact on global trade. Uh, Tesla's impact was mentioned earlier. But if they start hitting oil tankers, uh, that can have a material uh, effect on trade. Um, and secondly, what do ship owners do in response? We've already seen one of the world's uh, bigger tanker owner, a Danish company called Torm, saying that they will avoid the region. We've seen every, several other tankers uh, change course in the next few hours. So if and on top of the container industry, the tanker industry uh, starts to avoid the area. That will uh, mean that freight rates are higher, that oil takes longer to get to market, and it, and it will put some upward pressure on prices. And then, of course, the final uh, risk is that this escalates further, uh, starts to draw in regions nearer the Straits of Hormuz, the Porsche Persian Gulf, um, and ultimately the big risk would be any interruption uh, to flows out of the Persian Gulf. Okay, and those th those are the extreme escalations, aren't they? Aren't they in terms of uh, a, a, a ca catastrophe on, on a risk side? Uh, Kaylee, thank you very much. Will Kennedy, 
at London HQ. We've got two minutes to wrap it up, Prime Misra uh, and my guest, Jay Polowski. I'm looking at this through the lens of what it costs me to get a good from China to here in the United States of America or anywhere or to the port of L.A. And right now, those freight rates are belting higher. This invokes the reminiscence of COVID. Prior to you, first of all, because this bond market is just gone. Now, we're not bothered by these, these freight rates at the moment. That's my take. Yours? I agree. I, th I think the market's looking at other factors. Wage inflation starting to slow down. You know, rents are coming down. So I think the market's saying this is cost push, push inflation. If this does pick up, the Fed will not respond because it actually hurts the, the, the corporate sector as well as uh, the household sector. Jay, let me take it to you. Uh, transit volumes are down 45% in a four-week period. Shanghai's container uh, freight index up 16%. Um, equity markets, they just, all, all they want is rate cuts. They're not really that bothered about freight rates, but that's ignorance, isn't it? Um, no, I think it's the, the right uh, judgment of what's really important. Geopolitics, I actually see it as kind of a backhanded way of complementing the reality that macro factors globally are getting better. Jobs, inflation, central bank action, things are much more relaxed, and I don't really see this is going to change that. And so the focus that we have on elections, on, on this type of activity, mm -hmm. uh, I think is very small beer in the general scheme of things. And the markets are correct to not really price it in as a major factor. The major factors are early cycle, global economic recovery, return to macro stability, double digit earnings growth, markets breaking out around the world. That's the focus, at least from TPW advisory. Look, 100%, I'm with you. I hope the glass remains uh, half full. Two and a half hot wars uh, and, a few, and a few reminiscences of COVID. Uh, let's hope it stays fine for us all. Prayer, Prayer Mr. Uh, and Jay Pulowski, uh, keeping the light of risk alive. Coming up on the show, your morning calls. We discuss the outlook for the earnings season. We're underway. JP Morgan, you, you've got City, you've got it all there. And we're going to unpack it with UBS's Erica Najarian and Khan Accord's Tony Dwyer right here on the show. Good morning. Friday morning calls. This is what the analysts are describing on Wall Street. First up, Citigroup upgrading Qualcomm to a buy, pointing to strengthening inventories and improving channel checks. Next up, Mizuho upgrades Chesapeake to a buy, applauding the company's upcoming merger with Southwestern Energy. And finally, Oppenheimer raises its Netflix price target to 600 bucks, forecasting notable acceleration in subscriber growth. Where will that come from? A new show on Netflix? I feel one in the blood. Any season is upon us. The curtain has been raised on the banks. What will UBS make of the numbers? This is kind time to the open on Manus Cranny in for Jonathan Farrell. What a difference 30 minutes makes for you on risk. We're shifting into the green on the futures. We're getting ready for the cash to open. Is there more of a belief in the drop in rates and the disinflation story uh, rather than perhaps Jane Fraser, who missed by a billion dollars on our revenue? But then Jamie Dimon refreshed it all for us, didn't he? It's all good for the consumer in the USA. Rest of the markets, this is what we've got for you. Uh, as yields drop, very little impact uh, on euro dollar per se. The dollar is down generally, but not against the euro dollar. Yields do drop on this better than expected uh, PPI number, and the disinflation narrative remains alive. The Fed should get ahead of the curve. Uh, that is what Alfonso Pecatello told us this morning. Real rates are too high, and the Fed needs to cut and cut aggressively. On the escalation of missile strikes by the US and the UK uh, into Yemen, you have got oil bid up by over 3%, 74%. 28 is where we are. Is that a real value of war premium? They're clapping like Billy there at the Nasdaq and on the rest of the markets. Yeah, that's right. Cheer Jamie Dimon because the consumer in the USA is strong. Let's kick off with the financials. First of all, it is the sector to watch. It's uh, the theoretical curtain raiser to earnings season. Oh, 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 where did Alcoa go? Abigail, the new curtain raiser of the banks. Good morning. Good morning. And we do, of course, have JP Morgan popping higher. In fact, up more than 2%. It's best day since July of last year. So investors really liking those results. The best in 
Breed Bank into today, up more than 22 percent. Uh, so they beat adjusted earnings by about 10 percent. Revenues, as you mentioned, or actually that was on City, uh, a, a small miss of 39.94 billion. Uh, big numbers. Fick up 8 percent. Equities down 8 percent. Net interest income that was posted was a record. So that bank is really trading quite well. Wells Fargo down about 3 percent. Take a look at Bank of America down 2.1 percent. It's worst day uh, it's going back to October of last year. Uh, they beat the bottom line, the top basically in line. The bond trading activity declined as profits dropped there. A bit of a surprise. On the other hand, equities up about 12 percent. Investors looking at the bond trading. Then finally, Citigroup up 1.9 percent. Despite that $1 billion, greater than $1 billion uh, revenue miss, I think, Mattis, everybody is thinking that the restructuring is going to really help turn Citigroup around. Yeah, it's going to have a real impact, though. 20,000 jobs to go. This is the, the, the meat on the bone of the Fraser turnaround. Abby, thank you very much. Let's stick with the banks and get a little bit more information. The earnings call, Shanali Basik, was tuned in. What did you glean? A few things. You have Jamie Dimon when he had some caution in the initial release to investors. A wide range of risks on the horizon, man. As you are see seeing him still say they can hold on to good returns even in a choppy environment that's out there. What's important, as we know, they had their net interest income guidance raised just a little bit here to $90 billion expected for the full year. You have JP Morgan that also raised their uh, guidance for expenses as well for the full year. And investors, as you can see by the stock, are taking that as a willingness of Jamie Dimon to invest. Uh, a little bit of cost can go a long way if you're making more revenue on top of it. Similarly, over at Citigroup, you see the stock up. You have them also raising the bar for themselves. Jane Fraser expecting to bring in an extra $2 billion of revenue this year while keeping costs fairly stable. But, you know, different story at these different banks. You have headcount rising over at J.P. Morgan as opposed to Citigroup. The question is, when do these other businesses start to turn around? It's still green shoots out there for the messy parts of these businesses today that is investment banking as we know menace and trading yeah it just sounds as if we're going to go in for a whole heck of a lot of restructuring so Nani, thank you very much for tuning in to the morning call or the conference calls i should say that let's stick with the banks this is the state of play uh you've got a mixture jp morgan can anybody catch up with the net interest income guidance uh, jamie diamond gave us the consumer is strong uh, the consumer is brave that is the message from them jane fraser uh, detailing a little bit more she's disappointed with where the quarter is wealth management needs a shake-up uh, and of course, it's going to mean human capital headcount reductions. Uh, Citigroup goes bid uh, by just under 3%. This is what Opama's CEO said, wrapping it all up. Three quite divergent sets of results. JP Morgan firing in all cylinders, while Bank of America sputtered, and Wells Fargo, for its part, is managing expenses very tightly, able to eke out, small, small, eke out gains in net income by cutting costs. That really only lasts for a period of time. Erica Najjarian joins me now from UBS. Uh, Erica, even you are, are surprised by the net interest guidance from Jamie Dimon and the team over there. 90 billion uh, is, is quite strong, isn't it? So we were actually a little bit above 88. So it's not as much as a surprise. I'll tell you it's not a surprise. It's not a surprise that once again, Jamie is the one that's outperforming and delivering on the revenue expectations, even with the much more heightened, you know, um, enthusiasm in banks. Yeah, you, you know, you've got to say when he's talking, this is the seventh consecutive quarter of record net interest income. Talk me through the, the, the scale of shift as we go into this rate cutting cycle, because obviously net interest income guidance is based on the forward curves. The forward curves are shifting. Who is most at risk in an evolving rate cutting market? So based on their disclosure, interestingly, B of A could be most at risk because they're the most positively sensitive to rising rates. So if the opposite happens, clearly the opposite also happens for net interest income. Of the three banks that reported this morning, they're the only ones that haven't given a guide yet. So they typically give a guide during their call, which begins at 11 o'clock. And I think the stock performance today really hinges on what they say about net interest income. And the bogey for that is $56 billion, which is where consensus is. 
And in terms of, I, I loved how you encapsulated who, who bid up the, the bank index before Christmas. You're, you're very good. It was the macro tourists, the macro fund tourists who were in the bank, who were bidding up the bank. I mean, you've got to make your money somewhere, even if it's in the last four weeks of the year. So the macro, the macro tourists were in before Christmas, and you warned very clearly that it's about what the hedge funds do next on the bank. So tell me, what, what, what do you reckon of the market structure right now? So I think this is probably the best day of the reporting season, to be honest. So, you know, we essentially are seeing, you know, some of these banks really meeting the moment in terms of higher expectations. But if we just peel back underneath the surface, right? So in terms of net interest income, I think that you probably will not get as strong of an outlook from the regional banks. And the thing that we aren't talking about that I think could really, really potentially um, get everybody's attention next week is take a look what's happening with credit quality. We've been lulled into this um, you know, notion that we're going to get these rate cuts, these you know, 150 basis points of rate cuts and this perfect soft landing economy. But if you look at JP Morgan and B of A, they had higher losses in commercial, higher than we expected. At Wells, they had higher commercial real estate losses than expected for the fourth quarter. And for City, they had a higher outlook for card losses, so the consumer, than we expected for 2024. So there's definitely speedier normalization of credit. And perhaps the revenue numbers, the operating revenue numbers are masking that today. But that's definitely going to be a very interesting and not fun read across for the banks that report next week. No, yeah, but it's going to be much more about the investment banking flows next week. I, tell me this, Mike May obviously thinks City can double in the next couple of years. I mean, it was the big splashy story of the week. There's going to be a metamorphosis. It's going to double in price, and he took JP Morgan off the top slot. Would you be that brave? Look, um, as somebody that was a wrong bull on City for a decade, I, I, I think I just need to see a little bit more evidence. I think it's clear that the stock is cheap, and I think it's clear that they're making progress on expenses. I guess I'm just skeptical that um, we're not going to um, trip up here a little bit because, you know, I haven't really seen a bank do this magic trick where revenues are going up and expenses are going down. And that's really what's embedded in their return expectations. And look, maybe they were so bloated and so inefficient that that can happen for City. Mm -hmm. But again, I think, you know, I need a little bit more evidence in order to get off the sidelines despite that valuation. No, that, that's fair enough. And the red headline this morning, was, of course, was 20,000 job cuts uh, as part of that restructuring in totality. Erica, thank you so much for being with me. Uh, that is our guest from UBS. Uh, let's get the movers. Uh, the transports this morning, uh, what have we got, Simone? Well, we have Delta missing earnings expectations for the fiscal year of 2024. Even though it beat on the top and bottom line, it says that earnings per share for fiscal year 2024 are going to be uh, 6 to $7. Everyone had expected since 2021, this would be over $7. That's seeming to meet some concerns about pricing and potential cracks in consumer demand. That's why we're watching shares now down close to 7%, and the whole airline space is feeling this. We're we're also watching shares of Tesla this morning. Two big headlines out here. Tesla telling Reuters that it is going to suspend production at its only plant in Europe, a plant outside of Berlin, for two weeks starting later in January because of supply disruptions uh, in the red or traffic disruptions through the Red Sea, those Houthi attacks on container ships. Volvo coming out and saying it was going to do the same for a plant in Belgium for about three days. And separately, Tesla cutting prices in China, where consumer demand has been the big question all of this likely to play on, play on profit margins. Both of these names uh, down in early trading. Tesla shares down now one and three quarters of a percent menace. Simone, thank you very much. I dream of being, uh, what is it, diamond at Delta, but I'll leave you with a thought. Uh, joining me now is Tony Dwyer, Cam Canaccord uh, Genuity uh, with me on the markets. I'm trapped. I'm really trapped. I got the short end dropping. Okay, believes the disinflation narrative, and I've got an equity market that's a reluctant buyer of the disinflation narrative and the rate cuts. Where do you stand? 
Manus, thanks for having me. So it, it's really an interesting environment in terms of now you're you're almost going positive on the 210 yield curve. So that is getting everybody's attention. You're having, having an 11 basis point improvement in the two year today on the disinflation idea. And, and I've long said that over the last six months that inflation is not the problem. Inflation, the trajectory is coming down pretty sharply. The issue is going to be ultimately what, um, what lower margins and lower input costs are going to mean, which is Corporate earnings could have a little bit of risk near term. So um, I, th I think your earlier guess when you did the interview with Priya was was good because I think I'm in the camp that the Fed is going to have to cut rates more than the market thinks. Well, let's just, can, can we just break that down a little bit more? Because I've had two, three conversations on this now this morning, which is real rates are around uh, 3%. Depends on the measure that you have. CPI translates into a PCE of around 2%. So the narrative should be the Fed should be cutting for all the good disinflation reasons now, and yet the Fed narrative is push back, push back, push back, higher for longer, higher for longer. There's a divorce. There's a continuing divorce in the market uh, and the Fed. Well, it, and so what that dovish pivot did, man, is was very important because it shifted the outlook for money. Even though the Fed is suggesting that they're going to stay higher for longer, the economic data may compel them to do the opposite. Inflation was going up at the, we don't have to guess what the, the Fed uses. Of course, they look at the, P, the PPI and the CPI, but they've told us how many times they use the core PCE. That is going down as fast as it was going up. So by that definition alone, they were they were late getting into the tightening mode mm -hmm. because inflation had moved up too much on the core PCE. And now it's coming down to the same amount. So the idea in an election year that they're going to go up 25 basis points at a clip right up to the election doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Our view is that um, the as inflation comes down, it's going to make them get more aggressive. And ultimately, that's what benefits the market in the second half because the outlook for money will improve. We've had corporate credit new issuance surge. Mortgage rates are coming down. The, the mortgage spread to the 10-year Treasury is narrowing on comments that the QT might lessen. So, you know, we're in this environment where that, that dovish pivot hasn't affected what the Fed is really saying, but what it's affected is the credit markets and the availability of capital. Absolutely. And there's the twos, 10, spiking higher by eight basis points. I, I'll give you my dream, which is they, they cut rates by a couple of hundred basis points, I get approved for a mortgage in September and property prices don't fly away to the moon, Tony. There you go. There, there's a dream. <laughs> there's a dream for everybody if I get the credit rating right. Tell me this. Um, you say we had this rally. And in certain, in certain ways, 9.5% from the October 27th lows. I love the phrase that one guest said to me. It was weaponized FOMO. So here we are, we got our stake in the grind, we're at the start of the year, the banks, you know, nothing, nothing's going terribly wrong with the banks at the moment. So to me that says weaponized FOMO should still hold. Are you a buyer in general in these markets? Do you still think that risk can perform well with the landscape you've just outlined? So, man, as we came into the year, it, in late October, on October 27th, we, we put out a note called the stage is set for a rally. And coming into 2024, we wrote a note called opposite day because the setup coming into 2024 from a yeah. tactical perspective was exactly opposite of where it was at the end of October. You were extreme overbought. Um, volatility was historically low. And the 10-year bond yield has already moved down so much. You're not even getting the reaction now in that. You're getting it in the two-year. So our call has been that we're in the, an intermediate term correction. And, and it, you don't go down okay. every day. We're getting a bounce today. And you could have a little bit more of a bounce on, on the PPI and the banks. But ultimately, um, for us to, we do want to be a buyer. Over the course of the last two years, there's times where the market gets okay. into an extreme oversold territory and you want so, to buy it. The question is, do you rent it or do you own it? Now we want to wait for the correction and own it. Okay, we're going to have to leave it there, Tony. Thank you so much for joining with me. Good spirit of conversation there, Tony Dwyer uh, on the markets. This is Countdown to the Open right here on Bloomberg.